This Thursday, we're going to be starting our verse by verse, as far as I know, verse by verse through the book of Galatians. But today, this morning, I want to take one more angle, the bird's eye view, to look down into this book and find another theme that will help us as we go through the book. Why is this book of Galatians so important for today's church and for you individually? So this morning, I want to talk about spiritual burnout. Whether you have ever had it, you might be going through it now, or you will in the future. And the book of Galatians will help you to never experience burnout. It is impossible for the child of God to experience burnout. Let's get that straight. Burnout is not possible when you're living out of the grace of God. When you're living out of the life of Christ, you never would ever, that three and a half years, Jesus say, guys, we're gonna I'm going to take a vacation. I'm burned out. You, you never, now his body wore out where he had to take a, you know, go, go sleep and, and rest, but that's not burnout. That's not what I'm talking about. This is spiritual, mental burnout. So if you got your outline there, if you're not, if not, they're back there on the on the table back there. Looking at the introduction, the book of Galatians fights religion. And it's what burns you out, religion. Spiritual burnout is a result of religion. And you can start off, like you said in Galatians, you start off in the spirit and you're ending up in the flesh. And if that's what people do, and many do, when you start in the spirit, there's no burnout. When you resort and try to finish it out in the flesh is when burnout begins to happen. Let me give you a couple of illustrations that we've looked at over the past several weeks. Look at clogged arteries. The heart has to work overtime when the arteries are full of cholesterol. Is that right? Yeah. Your, your heart, that's what, that's what causes the heart attack is because the arteries are clogged and it makes the heart work harder. When the spirit of grace is not on us, that makes us work harder. And we're not going to have a heart attack. We're going to have spiritual burnout. See what I'm saying here? Now look at the other one. Try to run a marathon in grave clothes. In fact, when you're running a marathon, you find the lightest shoes, the easiest breathing shorts and tank top and all that because you want the least resistance or anything that would encumber you to run that marathon. Well, to be free in the spirit, to walk in the spirit, you can't have any flesh to encumber that. It's got to be all grace. It's got to be all God. Or you're trying to walk this thing out according to your own willpower and self-effort, and that's spiritual burnout. And what's happening in the church today is that the church, by not preaching Christ alone, which is the grace message, the new covenant, faith, we're putting people in positions of lifestyles, and they're, they're burning out if they're not already in burnout mode. You got a lot of people leaving the church today. You got a lot of people just barely hanging in there, burnout mode. Now, let me find for you, if you look at B there, this is a um, doctor's definition of burnout. So it's not my definition. Someone, but this is really good. Now, listen to this. Spiritual burnout is someone in a state of fatigue or frustration brought about by devotion to a cause. Devotion to a cause. Of course, in this case, it's the cause of Christ, hopefully. Brought about by a devotion to a cause, a way of life, or relationship that failed to produce the expected reward. So people come to church, and they have this expectation of how their life should be now that they're coming to church. And the church says you, you're going to have your best life now by doing these things. And so they, they've signed up for this way of life and this devotion to a cause, which is Christianity, and with an expected reward. Now read on. The man or woman who does not reach for the top will never suffer from burnout. Look at that again. The man or woman who does not reach for the top will never suffer burnout or from burnout. It is a condition found only among those who want the best. 
Uh, look at this. Every single one of us. Now, I am going to drop a nuclear bomb, spiritual nuclear bomb, this morning. And it's going to change the way you think, or you're going to kick back at it and keep thinking the way that you do. But the way that you're thinking, traditionally, and the way most of the church is thinking, is what's producing your burnout, your frustration. You may have a lot of more energy to write. You know, when I was in the late, my late 20s, I was all about the church and ministry. And man, I just had all this energy. I couldn't keep me still. And so I had to burn my flesh out. I had to burn all the false motives and the pride and the ego and had to always be right. Everything that was wrong about me had all this energy to do it. And God says, I'm going to let you run around that mountain now. However many times you need to run around that mountain before, you, before you're done. And God's going to let us take all that religious zeal and he's going to let us burn out. But sooner or later you will burn out if you're not already or have been. Now watch this. Here's where I want to drop the bomb. You have to stop the mentality that you're always trying to get the best for your life. That's not God. I have to get the best car. I have to have one of the best houses in town. We've got to have the best looking church. We have to have the best worship team. We have to have the best this, best that, best clothes. My kids have got to be the best kids in school. No one ever, where does that come from? See, that puts you and your kids and your family and your spouse on a performance treadmill that's unending. Because they'll never, best is perfect. So if you take a step back and wait a minute. I don't know if this is the American gospel that did this, the faith teachers, that I have got to have the best. I don't got to have, I don't, I don't got to drive the best car. You know, I got, a, I got a decent truck, and I pull up, but there's someone got a better truck than me. I look over, man, that, that really makes mine look shameful. But mine isn't shameful. And I may have a beat-up, old, rusty car, and someone in a brand-new car. You got to get rid of that mentality of try, oh, comparing yourself and your material things to other. You are not called to get the best that's in this life. And I hear people, well, wouldn't God want me to have the best? No. Let's just get, no. Because if so, he's falling short. I ain't got the best house in Clarksburg, do you? I ain't driving the best car. I ain't making the biggest salary. And I am not in perfect health. How about you? So that ship sailed along. And why are we keeping pursuing something that's a pipe dream called best? And then we sell a book, Your Best Life. My best is in Christ. That's it. If I, if I am found in Christ alone, that's the best God gives me. And everything else is blessing, not best. Did you just hear that? Everything else is blessing, not best. Have you ever given a gift to somebody? Oh, man, I mean, come on, it's kids nowadays. Every kid, every kid suffers from the American dream or gospel. God, it, it, you ever give somebody a gift? I'm just putting this up there. We're not going after best. We're going after the blessing. But if you ever got a gift for somebody and you, you know, you went out and spent some money and time and effort, or, or a car, you went through all the cars, and and they open it, oh that's nice, and they close it back. I'm like, wait, that's it? Did you just did you read all of that was in there? I spent time finding. Or they open up the gift. Ha, oh, that's nice. And they close it up. But if you ever, with kids, buy them clothes on Christmas. They open, once their eye sees it, back, flip, next. So what are we, what, what, we're wanting the best, and you're never going to get it, because someone already has it. Hmm? So we got to stop with this best, because that's what's burning you out. You keep looking for the things to get better, called best, Things can get better, but not best. That's perfectionism. Best is perfectionism, and that's going to burn you out real quick. Now, religion never pays off. It always causes us to fall short. Galatians 5, 4. Do I have that one? You have become severed from Christ. You have fallen from grace. When that happens, burnout 
is right around the corner. That's, that's just, it's as simple as that. As soon as you, and what does it mean to fall from grace? Fall from your unity, your abiding, your relationship in oneness with Christ. When you fall out of that and start looking at rules and regulations and things that you can do to become or to be better, and it's all out there, it all makes it, 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 every religious message out there, every program is designed to get you out of Christ. It's, it's an, I'll even go so far to say, and this is my opinion because it, most will disagree with me. But if I, if, if anybody preaches something other than Christ, that's Galatians 1, 4, 5, 6. But if anybody preaches you out of your union and in that type Christ spirit, there's no way around it. Because they're getting you out of Christ into something else. I don't care what it is. Even if it's your best effort, that's outside of Christ. And, the, and if it's not Christ-oriented, then it's an anti Christ spirit getting you out of it. And that's why Paul was so hard saying, let them be accursed. Because it's an anti-Christ spirit. Galatians offers us life in the spirit. Galatians 5.25. If we live in the spirit, let us also walk in the spirit. That is the only way to stay out of burnout. And that's the only way to have a life and have it more abundantly is by the life of Christ that's in you, which is the life of Jesus. Galatians 2.20 is... What's going on inside of you? We, we can, we, we've, we've used this verse a million times. It's no longer I who lives, but it's Christ who lives in me. And that, you keep that, you'll never experience burnout because Christ in you is living through you. It's the unity within, not the religion without. It's the unity within, not the religion that's on the outside. Even church life is, can be religious. It can be life-oriented or it can be religiosity. The believer who walks in the Spirit Manifesting the life of Christ will never experience burnout. Galatians 3 5. We don't have that. And I think that's him saying, Does he not, he who works miracles among you, does he do it by the works of the law or by the hearing of faith? So, he who works miracles among you, does he not minister the Spirit and work miracles among you? That's how, that's day to day living, guys. He's working the Spirit. He's ministering the Spirit and working power in you. You can't burn out on that. There's no way to burn out on that. Okay? Spiritual burnout number three. You get number three? Go to 2 Kings chapter 4. 2 Kings chapter 4. Remember how we talked about several weeks ago on Thursday night how to read the Old Testament? Yes, it's literal, but that's a veil. We gotta look beyond the bill and find out why is the story in there. So let's look at it. This is verse 38. And Elisha returned to Gilgal, and there was a famine in the land. Now the sons of the prophets were sitting before him, and he said to his servant, Put on the large pot. Now they're hungry. So he says, Put on the large pot and boil stew for the sons of the prophets. Next. So one went out into the field to gather herbs. And he finds a wild vine. So he gathered from it a lap full of wild gourds and came and sliced them up and put them into the pot of stew, though they did not know what they were. Looks good, put it in there. Smells good, put it in there. Next. Then they served it to the men to eat. And now it happened, as they were eating the stew, that they cried out and said, Man of God, talking to Elisha, there is death in the pot. In other words, that plant was poisonous. They didn't know it. So he says there's death in the pot and they could not eat it. Death in the pot and they could not eat it. Next. So he said, Elisha, bring some flour and he put it into the pot and said, serve it to the people that they may eat and there was nothing harmful in the pot. Now that's supernatural. Their flour is not going to take cyanide out of water. But that's just an act that God told him to do. He took care of it. They were able to eat. Now, that's a that's step of faith to eat, right? Flour. You can just put some carbs in there. That's going to do it, carbs. Anyway, do you see the story? Now, what is that significant of? What, what are we supposed to learn from that today? You can go and do your historical stuff on it and find out all the ins and outs, and that's fine to do. But what does that speak to us today? What does that story mean to you today? Now, what, what I want to share with you 
from this story is that broth that's in that stew is legalism. That is the only thing that kills you in your walk with God and a church or ministry is legalism. That's the, that's the death in the pot. Every day, every day, pastors, ministers, preachers, teachers, are, they sit all week long and they put together a word for you, like I did here. And there are different scriptures, there's different illustrations, there's different interpretations of scriptures, and there is a mindset, there's a belief system that they're going to incorporate in this message, and it's either going to come out faith-oriented or legalistic. Performance-oriented or promise-oriented. And when they put legalism in the message, that's death to your spirit. That's death to your spiritual life. Legalism is, go to 2 Corinthians chapter 3, it's not up there. But everybody got your Bible, I want you, I want you to see, I'm going to prove to you that, that Galatians is the flower that's going to go in that pot and keep you from dying spiritually called burnout, okay? Now go to 2 Corinthians chapter 3, I'm going to prove it to you. You can't, there's no wiggle room here. Okay, 2 Corinthians chapter 3. Let's start at verse 5. Paul speaking that we, to that Corinthians, that we, not that we are sufficient of ourselves to think of anything as being from ourselves, but our sufficiency is from God, who has made us sufficient as ministers of the new covenant. This is, this gospel is the new covenant. You see that? Underline that. A lot of people just, I don't know what they think the new covenant is or what they, or if they even think that the gospel new covenant is the same. But he says we are ministers of the new covenant. You understand that? Ministers of the new covenant. That's a pot of stew you can eat. Ministers of the old covenant is a pot of stew that's got death in it. I'll prove it. Look at the next verse. The, we are ministers of the new covenant, not of the letter, but of the spirit. Why not the letter? What's the next verse say? Why not the letter? The letter kills. That's the, that's the poison in the stew. The law kills. So if you lace a message with law, you're going to burn your people out. Some more so faster than others, depending upon their willpower and zeal. Some people can go a long time before they burn out others. One, one message already burns them out. I can't do that, and they're done. You lay something on them, they can't do it, and they walk out defeated. Now watch. Letter of the law kills, but the Spirit gives life. That's proof, too. Let's just do this. That the Spirit replaces the law. You don't get this it's over. Walk away. You're never going to get it. Never going to get it. Like that song, you're never going to get it, never going to get it, never going to get it, never going to get it. You're never going to get it. If you don't understand that the Spirit replaces the law, you will be in burnout all, all the time. Because the law kills. I don't need rules. I don't need regulation. I don't need step secrets and keys. I've got the Holy Spirit, the Spirit of Christ in me, the life of Christ, who's doing the work. And producing in me the power, the drive, the desires to do. We've talked about this a million times. Now watch this. But look at what he calls it in verse 7. What? That's your pot of stew right there. The ministry is the pot of stew. Now, the ingredients is in either the spirit or law. What are you going to put in it? More rules? More, th more hoops to jump through? More things to accomplish? Now, let's go to B. I ain't going to spend a lot of time there because we, we should know this, but I'm, I'm bringing it back to your attention. How many have heard of the term fence laws? Fence laws, the Pharisees were notorious for fence laws, especially them. And what a fence law is, I don't know if I can pull this off on the board or not, but let's say um, 
let's say here's a main highway, okay? And here's a sidewalk, here's your yard, here's your house, and you got a dog there in that yard. Now you're gonna fence them in, right? So they can't get out here and get hit by a car. You fence them in. That gives you an idea of what fence laws mean. So what they did was the Ten Commandments were not enough. They came up with laws. So in other words, this is your fence. And you're like, I don't even want him to get close to that fence. So I'm going to create another fence and reduce the size of the yard. You ain't gonna have as much room to be free because I'm gonna create another fence to make sure he don't break through that fence. That's your fence laws that religion comes up with. So here's what happens. Thou shalt not commit adultery. Now we get into all kinds of things the church puts on you so you won't commit adultery. The law of don't commit adultery is not enough. Now we're going, to sh we're, going to, we're going to tell girls they can't wear their skirts so high. They got to wear it down here. They got to put their hair up in the bun. They can't wear makeup because we got to make sure that they don't tempt the man in any way, shape, or form so that adultery occurs. Alcohol. We got to make sure that they don't get drunk. So we're just going to say don't drink alcohol. So don't drink alcohol and therefore they don't get drunk. But we know that Paul says don't get drunk, but we don't find anything in there where it says you can't drink alcohol. So we come up with these fence laws, and then, well, we don't even want them to drink alcohol, so we're going to say Mountain Dew will, will resemble alcohol, and that tempts you for alcohol. And now, this is, a, this is, a, this is the truth. This is a, the church was against Mountain Dew. So... They come up with, and then this hits every area of life. These fence laws will hit every single area of your life, and this is what legalism is. And so that's going to burn people out because all that does is just give them more things that they can't do that they really do have the freedom to do, but these religious laws, fence laws, keeps people from doing it. So the fence laws covers every area of life. That's why you have all these different churches. Go to every single church. They have their little list of what they what they believe you can do and can't do. So this church over here believes you can drink wine. This church over here says you can't drink wine. This church over here says you better never go to a movie theater. This church over here says, well, whatever. You, 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 you're, you're an adult. You can choose what movies you want to watch. You can hear the Spirit. And you've got all these different denominations based on some type of offense law. Well, we don't, we don't listen to music in our church. We just sing a cappella. That's just, that's just another rule, another regulation for whatever reason they have. Or you, you can get into all you get into theology, you get into dogma, you get into all kinds of things. This creates all this. But it it's it's meant to burn you out because there's no freedom in it. It's it's you always listening to a guy coming up with something else that you can't do. Limiting your freedom in the Lord. And there are buku's offense laws out there, rules and regulations. They're not. They're 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 endless. Another thing for burnout. I'm just giving you things to burn. The things that will burn us out. And that, that's legalism for sure. And there are different aspects of legalism here. But the spirit of perfection that's in the church that you can never attain. You're perfect inwardly, complete in Him. But when you have a perfectionistic message. And you're around someone who's a perfectionist, or you have a preacher. See, let, let me just let's just stop here on the on the perfectionism. When I first got born again, I was 15 years old, and for like three years, the rest of my time in high school, a little bit out of it, I was under a person that every single message was to point out that something is wrong with me. It's like, okay, what can I find that I know is wrong with these kids? And then, here's the altar to do what? Repent and what? Make it right. And then make a confession that you're not going to do it anymore. How many grew up in that? 
So every message is designed to show you your shortcoming then come up here and repent of it and make sure you don't do it again and then go out there. And while you're out there trying not to do it again, this guy's going to up the ante by picking out something else that's going to be wrong with you when you come next week. And it doesn't stop. That's burn, that, that will burn you out. And it did. I'm, I, I, after I, three years of that, I'm like, I'll never live that kind of life. Screw it. I'm not going to walk away from God. I'm not going to leave church. But I'm going to let it go one year, not the other. I can't be that. Oh, and every now and then they might hit on a good one. I'm like, yeah, that's really me. I need to. But you can just go back out there and do it again because there's no grace in it. It's all legalism. This is what goes on in churches. Again, I told you Thursday night or was it last Sunday? I don't remember. I said, you guys are spoiled because there are people that go through this every single Wednesday week. week. We don't. They do. So when I'm speaking on it, but I'm going to get to us in a minute because you may not have that kind of a mentality or ministry, but I'll show you one that will when we get to it. But so let, let me just tell you, where, let me show you my burnout. Can I share my burnouts with you? It's going to help maybe somebody listening or somebody here. So I got burned out as a youth. I can't do that. So I quit coming to the altar because why? After, I'm not that smart, but I'm smart enough to know this is just another lap around the mountain. And, and then the, 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 the speaker would get mad if the kids wouldn't come up to the altar. So he would just bang away more while the music is playing until everybody would come up. Hit on every possible sin out there just to get everybody at the altar. And it was a while, for a while there, I just refused. I, yeah, that's me, but I'm not going because I know what you're doing. That's a, this, this is a ministry of death, and you're killing me. I'm done. And it wasn't long before God moved me out of that church. That was my first burnout as a youth. The second burnout was ministry. Denominationalism, when I saw the politics of it. And got really raked over the coals. This is when I was in Arizona in the late 80s. And I'm like, I'm done with that too. I'm not playing this game anymore. And I walked away from denominationalism. I walked away from the professional church, the church institutionalized, that which is organized. Walked away from it. Only to walk into a non-denominational church, because non-denominational can be as restrictive as a denominational church. Just because you're non-denominational doesn't mean you're free at all. So then my third burnout was being an administrator of a large church and we were more about administrating the thing and keeping up with all I mean when you when you create a big engine that engine starts running you you don't run it anymore that machine starts running you and you're all you're doing is keeping up with the needs and they are a lot they're huge and not only that but I was in a, I was in a marriage that was a perfectionistic marriage that burned me out. I had a church that wanted perfection. I had a marriage that wanted perfection. And all I heard from people, you need to, you need to, you need to, you need to. And then when you don't do what they think you need to do, you get browbeaten and raked over the coals, and it's a non-ending fight. And you do that over year after year after year, I promise you, you will burn out. Now, I ain't blaming anybody because we're all guilty because we're, we don't know the truth. It's the truth that's supposed to set us free. And they're not giving us the truth called Galatians to keep us free. So we're into legalism. And you can be legalistic in church. You can be legalistic in a relationship. You can be really legalistic as a parent. And you just beat the life out of people. Big, that's death in the stew. And what you deal out with people is death all day long. And when they burn out or walk away... Oh, now we got another thing we can beat them up on. They walked away. You burned them out. See, you don't want to say responsibility. Oh, we'll just, we'll just condemn them for leaving, whether it's a job, a church, a relationship, a marriage. We'll condemn the hell out of them, but not the person that burned them out. <clears throat> We're like, I'm done. This is this 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 is a this thing is an endless ladder, and all you keep doing is giving me rung after rung after rung, and, and every rung I get to, you keep beating me that it's never enough. You do that. Be around someone like that. It ain't gonna last long, I promise you. But oh, we keep being, we keep putting death in the stew. We keep dealing out the death stew called legalism in relationships, in churches, ministries, so forth and so on. So I've had my time of burnout. 
I'm burned out on being burned out. And I'm not going to take, here's my last burnout. And it was just recently. This is why Luther said you've got to read the book of Galatians every six months, stay free, so you don't get caught up in this stuff. The, the last burnout was this past year. I'm, I, it's like, okay, I'm not going to listen to these guys anymore because I just feel like there's no light on that. I'm going to start listening to these guys. And, I'm gonna, and then not realizing, listening to these guys, um, they're not free. They're bound by their own rules. They have, they have methods for their spirituality. They have ways and means to accomplish this, that, and the other. And they're, they have their own religious drives and if you listen to them long enough that spills over on you before you know it. you're you're caught up into this again not even knowing it and it's not about so much and it is it's a form of legalism it's not it, but it's not easy to detect because it's spiritual it's spiritual and finally God dropped the bomb on that and I said I'm done you know what I'm done I'm done with all this you follow people that keep giving you things to do Keep giving you books to read. Keep giving you this. What? But they never give you Jesus. They never encourage you in the relationship. Just sit still. Be still and know that he is God. How come he? You don't hear that? Oh, no. Here, read this book. Oh, watch this seminar. How about just be still and know that he is God? Hey, well, they can't make any money off of that. That's too boring. They got to keep the machine going. So here's a new angle. Here's a new take. Here's a new step, a new secret, a new key. I'm done with all that, guys. That's why we're hitting Galatians again, because we're going for the juggler this time around. So I'm sitting, I'm sitting just this past week. And I'm sitting in the chair and I'm talking to God, and I'm really frustrated at the church and all the preachers out there that I've come in contact with. And I've come in contact with a lot of them. Worked for Christian television, met, met a lot of them. But I, I'm I'm like, does anybody not have an angle? Has anybody got a clear, pure motive in just presenting Jesus with no angle? They're not, they're not trying to grow their ministry, steal somebody from, their, from another church, make money off of you. Can we just not come together and be about one thing and let Jesus take care of the rest of the things that, we're, that we work as angles? Anyway, just stop. Because you just, wait a minute, wait a minute. Wait a minute. So I'm sitting there and I'm saying, is there anyone? And, I'm, and I really want to be fair. And I said, I can only think of one that I've never been disappointed in. One. One. That lines up with the Christ-centered, um, Christ Christocentric message. One. And I'm like, you know, and I'm done. I'm done. I don't understand it. Maybe you can help me understand it. But when I listen to messages, they're not Christ-centered. They have an angle. I don't care if I don't care if your angle is that you want me to get a breakthrough. That's your angle. Breakthrough. Seek first the kingdom. All these things get at. I don't need to emphasize breakthrough. You emphasize Jesus, you get the breakthrough. In fact, you already have the breakthrough in Christ. You just have to have your mind renewed on Jesus. That's your breakthrough. Not. I'm just done. Okay. I, I, if I keep going, I'm going to make myself mad. I'm just going to talk myself into being mad. Here's another one. Sin consciousness. You can't do that. The sin was taken care of so you can focus on relationship. If all you're going to focus on is sin, you'll never have time to seek Jesus. You'll never have time to look and behold his beauty because you're always trying to fix yourself. Because they're constantly pointing out your sins. NASCAR drivers, they, they, they say, if you, if, you, if, you, if you focus on the pothole, you'll hit it. They don't focus on the potholes. Not that there's any in the race, but they're just saying, the way you drive is that you don't focus on the pothole. You gotta look beyond that and have that in the peripheral because you're looking at something else. You're not there to 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 you're there to get to go somewhere, not just to find potholes to, to, to veer away from. Unless you live in West Virginia, then you're constantly looking everywhere. But my point is you don't you can't look at the thing at hand and take care of it. Because then because if I'm looking at the sin, what am who am I not looking at? 
This is, this is ingenious for God. He's like, I will take care of the sin so you can focus on me. Because if I don't take care of the sin, you'll never focus on me. As the answer, you'll keep focusing on ways and means to beat that sin. So I'm done with sin consciousness. I, ha, 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 how much is it working for you to focus on sin and using willpower and self-effort? Or 12 steps to overcome the thing. And all it does keeps you on a performance treadmill that will burn you out. Now I'm almost done. Now in Psalms 127, we don't have it. And it's not on your outline. You want to put this on your outline. So this morning as I'm meditating, this verse comes to me. And I see it. Not in a different way, but I see it a little bit more clearer. It says, they... Let's see if I get it right. I'm, I'm, I'm not turning to it. Um, what is the girl? Psalms, um, Psalms 127.1. They... If the Lord doesn't build the house, they that labor, what? Labor in vain. Labor in vain. Now, this has got nothing to do with the temple, although in that day it did. But again, that's got to go beyond the veil. Who's the house of the Lord? We are. We're the temple of the Holy Spirit. And they, if God doesn't build you, if God's not doing the work, all your labor is in vain because you don't enter into rest. Labor to do what? Enter into rest so he can work. So quit looking at that scripture as the church building. If the Lord isn't building you up in Christ, rooting and grounding you in him by way of the ministry of the Spirit, then everything you do, all the labor you do is in vain, and there's your burnout. You're going to go, well, look at all the work I've done. How did I get here? Yeah, you labored in vain. It was legalistic. It was works-oriented, not rest-oriented. So here's, and I know we've talked about this, but it goes along with this. We'll, we'll reiterate it again. The more I rest, this is, your, this is another um, um, paradox. The more I rest, the more he works, and I'm working with him. The less I rest, the more I work, he's not, I am, and that's your labor in vain. To keep you from laboring in vain, you've got to work on resting. And it's an oxymoron because it doesn't make sense that I've got to rest to work. It makes perfect sense when you know who the one in you that's doing the work. So you don't burn out. God's like, can you imagine walking with Jesus and he was a perfectionist and he'd have every right to point out every beam in your eye? Because he doesn't even have a speck. He don't have nothing. He, so he could have picked on his disciples 24-7. Because he's the law incarnate. He could have picked on every single attitude, every look, every remark, every breath. Like, what's that mean? What's that mean, Peter? I heard that breath. Oh, James, you just rolled your eyes. What's up with that rolling the eyes? I saw you roll your eyes. This is what we do in relationships. What, what, what's, what's, that, what's that comment supposed to mean? Pastors, I wonder what he means by that. Is he talking about me? It's just, it's unending. So, what we've got to get to the place is Jesus didn't do that to his disciples. He's not doing that to you right now. In you, he could be just ripping you a new one every hour on the hour. Could he not? You want to talk about condemnation? And he'd have every right because he's perfect. But he doesn't do that. He doesn't do that. He has a way of speaking and ministering out of love that you're right on board with it. And then when you hear it and experience it, transformation occurs. It's the greatest way of doing it. We can't do it. Only the Spirit can. Do you understand that? He's the only one who can work that way. You can try to emulate it, but you can't because you're not the Spirit. It's only the Spirit in the person that keeps them from burning out and yet is able to point out things periodically and keep them from condemnation, from burnout, from, from condemnation and guilt and shame and all of that. But we've got to rest. And they don't, churches don't want to preach rest. 
Because then you might stop doing what they're manipulating you to do. You may not give like you used to. You may not um, work in the church. What's this guy supposed to do if the money's not coming in and the volunteers aren't there? So he's got to get the whip out, craftily whip you, and not even let you know you're being whipped, only to watch you burn out. And then he'll blame you for the burnout. What'd you do wrong? Dude, you were putting death in the pot every Sunday morning, and then you're going to criticize me because I don't want to come to church anymore because I'm burned out? You're going to criticize me for that when you're the one putting death in the stew? You see how this is working? Closing. Religion is binding oneself to the keeping of rules that govern conduct, rituals, and formulas by which to approach God. It calls for the exercise of the devotees will will be will will for complete obedience to its precepts. And the reason for binding oneself is to please God and other people, and to and to be by Him, to please Him and be led by Him or be by Him. I know that might be a typo. But here's what, here's, here, let me close with this. It's a tall ladder with endless rungs, unending to-do list. Trying to do God's part is going to burn you out. Trying to grow will burn you out. Trying to be somebody else will burn you out. Trying to please God will burn you out. Trying to please others will burn you out. And these things are guaranteed burnouts. And the devil knows it. So look at that little list. There's more. I'm just, this is what came to me. Watch, let me wait one more time. That endless ladder of wrongs, stop it. Because what you're trying to do is, is, is to do God's part or change yourself. It goes to, to uh, see. Trying to do God's part will burn you out. Trying to grow, produce fruit, that's going to burn you out. Trying to be like somebody else will burn you out. Trying to please God, trying to please others, these are all guaranteed burnouts. But the book of Galatians is the flour that we're going to put in the stew that we're all eating every Sunday called grace, new covenant, the Holy Spirit, faith. Th these are guaranteed. If you've had spiritual, if you've had burnout, you have to ask yourself, what diet am I on? What diet am I on? And that's what happened to me this year. I had to change my diet of what I was listening to. And these guys aren't going to hell. These guys aren't bad people. They just aren't ministering out of the new covenant. Because when you minister out of the new covenant, you minister out of the spirit, and, and, and you get the people to rest by focusing on the Lord that does the work. In fact, you will, you will work way more than maybe you've ever had before, and you'll have all this strength and energy and anointing, and you're like, I don't understand it. The more I rest, the more I work. I don't, I, I don't get it. I don't get it. But I refuse to be busy for the sake of being busy. I refuse to do things for people anymore if, I, if the Spirit's not leading me to do it. Because I'm, I'm, just, I'm done with being burned out. Because the Bible gives us ways and means not to burn out. And it's the person of Jesus. It's the ministry of the Spirit. And if I'm burned out, it's because of the diet that I'm on or these things I'm trying to accomplish on my own or out bypassing the spirit and doing it on my own. That's again laboring and God's not doing the work. God's not building the house. So that scripture really hit me this morning. If God isn't building you up in Christ, all your labor is in vain. All your self effort is going to burn you out. Heavenly Father, we thank you Lord for the spirit replacing the law. We thank you for the new covenant that, over, that, that, that surpasses the old covenant and puts it out of business. We thank you for the life of Christ, the grace of God, and the promises and the faith you give us. All of these secure that we never burn out, but we're always growing in God, growing in grace, going from glory to glory, from grace to grace, from faith to faith. This just isn't your personal life with God. It goes into the life of the church. And it goes from the life of the church into relationships, even marriages. Are we burning each other out with law? 
or are we ministering the spirit to one another? What are you ministering to your family, to your spouse? What are pastors ministering to the congregation? More work? More rules? More steps? More programs? Another to-do list? Another rung on the ladder? Or do we minister the Spirit? And when we minister, when we minister the Spirit, we're ministering Jesus, as are all in all. Lord, open our eyes this morning. As we know, burnout is not the will of God. It's impossible for a Christian to spiritually burn out. And when they do, there's poison in the stew.